Amen. So the title of the, smir- the sermon this morning is Wise Men Wanting, Wise Men Wanting. And I'm going to preach about the fact that today uh, we need men to not only fulfill their role as men, their God-ordained position as fathers, as leaders, but we need, to do them, we need them to do that with wisdom. Okay, and if you would, go over to James chapter 1, James chapter 1. The title is Wise Men Wanting. Now, what do I mean by wanting? You know, it's not what do wise men want. You know, the word wanting simply means uh, t- uh, that there's something lacking, that there is a need. We could say it's wise men in need, right? Uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't alliterate. It doesn't roll off the tongue. It's nice. So it's wise men wanting. And really to want something is to lack. It means something's absent. It means that we're deficient in some area. And today, you know, in this country and in this world, we are in need of men, not only to be men to lead, but to be men who will lead with wisdom. We need wise men today. And I believe we see that our homes, our churches, our nation, are, it, it, they, they are, these things are all suffering because of the fact that there is a lack, not only of, of men leading, but the men that are there are leading without wisdom. They do not have the wisdom that comes from God. So that's what I mean by the, that there are wise men wanting, that wise men are wanting today. The Bible says in Titus 1, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set a, should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. So there's that use of that word that there are things that were wanting, there were things that were lacking. Specifically in Titus, he's talking about the fact that Paul wanted there to be elders or bishops or pastors in every city in the island of Crete. You're there in James chapter 1, we'll see another instance where this word is used. It says in verse 4, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire. So, you know, we have an understanding today of the word perfect to mean, you know, we're faultless, like there's nothing wrong with something. But in the Bible, the word perfect simply means what? Perfect and entire, or to be complete. As it goes on and says, they're wanting nothing, meaning it doesn't lack anything, it doesn't want anything, it doesn't need anything, because it is perfect and entire. So when I say that there are wise men wanting today, what I'm saying that our country, our churches, our homes have a need for wise men. Not just men. They need wise men to lead them. And wise men are needed because it is given to man to be the leadership. And this isn't popular. You know, this is what's going to be taught in universities or any, you know, school of learning. But this is what the Bible says, and I make no apology for it. The Bible says that God has ordained men to lead and not women. Men are to be leaders. In fact, men are natural uh, natural born leaders. And women are natural born followers. There's nothing wrong with that. Somebody has to lead and somebody has to follow. If everybody was a leader, nothing would get done. I mean, you apply that to any other uh, situation in life or any situation in life. This church, for example, if we all just showed up here this morning and just everyone gets to make decisions about how things are, how the order of services is going to go, what songs are going to be sung, what Bible we're going to use, which direction we're going to face, whether or not we're having, you know, if all these decisions that had to be made week in and week out in this church were made just by anybody and everybody, that'd mean everybody was a leader, nobody was a follower, that it would be, a, it would be a, a madhouse in here. And there, there would be no order, okay? But because there is a God-ordained leader, because there is somebody in charge who is setting the example and saying, this is how things are going to be done, something gets accomplished. So there's nothing wrong with the fact that God has ordained some people to lead and some people to follow, Okay? And that's just the way it is. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 1, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. I mean, there's Paul, that, that pompous jerk, insisting that people would follow him. Who does he think he is to set himself up as some kind of a leader? No, that's the right way to do things. God wants people in leadership. We need leaders today, and men need to lead, and not only lead, but to lead with wisdom. Wise men are wanting today. It says in verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So there is an authority structure that God has set up. What is that authority structure? Well, the head of every man is Christ. And he's not talking about, you know, sometimes the word man in the Bible just means mankind, man and woman. It always pre- refers to the group in the masculine sense, right? But in this instance, he says specifically that every man, meaning those that are men, their head is Christ. And their head, meaning that's their authority, that is who is over them, right? That is the, the leader, the head, okay? You know, we have a perfect picture of that in our own bodies. You know, our head is where 
the mind is. It's what directs us. It's what, you know, we're the, the, the brain that sends all the, uh, you know, the, the signals to the rest of the body to get it to do what it needs to do, right? So you can kind of, you see how that word head is being used. It means an authority, that which is leading, that which is in charge. The head of every man is Christ. So men have a leader, have a, uh, have a leader that's God. And the head of the woman, so now we know we're not talking about just men in general, just or mankind in general, but specifically men and women and their respective roles as laid out in Scripture. It says that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man. So, and it doesn't, you know, and this is talking specifically about, you know, husbands and wives. You know, just because I'm, I'm the man doesn't mean I'm, you know, the head of over every woman that exists. I'm the head over my wife, Okay. And it says, the head of the woman is the man. Go over, to, you know, keep something in 1 Corinthians 11. You might want to just put the bullet in there or something because we're going to come back at the end of the sermon to look at this passage again. But go over to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. You know, and this is uh, this principle that men are the ordained leadership, that it is, God has ordained men specifically to lead is throughout Scripture. Okay, this isn't just Paul being... You know, Paul wasn't just misogynistic. Paul just didn't have a miss. This wasn't just Paul's opinion. This is the way God set things up. We could go back to Genesis 3, but we probably all know this. Verse 16, under the woman, he said, this is the Lord speaking. He, the Lord, said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So the Bible teaches very clearly that when it comes to this, uh, the authority structure within marriage that the man is the head over the woman, that he is to be the leader, okay? Now that's, in, 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 we could see that we could apply this to other areas as well though, not just in the, in the area of a marriage, but also I believe the Bible teaches that men are to lead in the country, okay? And I'm sure this is gonna, you know, this would harrow up every liberal in the county, but I don't care, okay? Because this is what the Bible teaches. I mean, look where, it, look where it's gotten us. Look, look at where the leadership has gotten us. We are, this country is going morally bankrupt today, and men are the ones that have let it happen. Men got weak, men got soft, and just let women take over and begin to lead this country. And the Bible, we'll see here in a minute, that's actually a curse from God, okay? First Timothy chapter 2, it says in verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now it says there, he suffers not a woman to teach, and this isn't a separate statement, statement here. It says not to teach, comma, nor to usurp authority over the man. So the Bible isn't saying that women should just never teach. I don't believe that. I believe that there's a place for women to teach. They teach their children. They can teach other ladies. They can, they can have that. But it says specifically they are not to teach nor to usurp authority, what? Over the man. Because God has ordained that men are to be the leaders. They are the ones that should be the ones that have to make the tough decisions, that have to be the leadership. Because, you know, this isn't a, some kind of chest-pounding sermon where you say, oh, we're the men. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with that position. You know, if I were to sum up what it means to be a leader in one word, you know, what does it mean to be a leader as a husband? What does it mean to be as a leader as a father? What does it mean to be a leader as the deacon of this church, the preacher here? What does that mean? What, if you could just sum it up in one word, what would it be? Pressure. Just this constant, unrelenting pressure that's just there, just bearing down to fulfill, uh, you know, to lead, to guide, to help people, to feed the flock, to guide my family, uh, you know, to guide my wife, that's a constant pressure that's put upon men. And that's why, you know, God has put it upon men. And, you know, God, the Bible says that, that the woman is the weaker vessel, okay? She's the weaker vessel. And that we are to honor the wife as the weaker vessel. But God has given a man, you know, men and women are, complete, are, are created completely differently, you know, in the, in the way they think and the way they feel about things and the way the decision making, you know, I believe that is done on purpose because of the fact that God has ordained men to be leaders. They need to be able to handle the pressure, make the difficult decisions, live with the consequences, and so on and so forth. I don't want to go on and on about this. and This isn't the thrust of the sermon. But i got to make the point real early in the sermon that men are ordained to lead. And whenever you say that, especially in 2021 America, you have to clarify it. And you have to prove it from the scripture. Because as soon as you say that, you know, everyone starts to freak out and say, what do you mean women can't lead? Well, you know what? They can if they want to, and they have plenty of opportunity in this country, but that's not what God wills, okay? They can go ahead and put on the power suit and the high heels and clack around in the offices and, and make a big noise and, and try to, you know, boss men around all they want, but that, and, and maybe even do a good job out of it, but it's not what God ordained. It's not scripture, okay? In fact, go, keep something in 1 Timothy 2. Go, I know I've got you in two different places, you know, 1 Corinthians 11. Just keep something there. We're coming back, but go keep something in 1 Timothy 2. I'll try not to sprain a finger this morning, but go over to Isaiah chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 3. 
You know, women, you know, they have opportunity to go out and lead today. And we see it all the time. And we've got a vice president, Kamala Harris, who's a woman. And everyone just wants to applaud the fact that there's a woman in the White House. You know, but what kind of woman is she? I mean, is she even worth somebody who's worth, you know, applauding? And I'm not going to get all political because I really don't follow politics. But, you know, I would just say, well, it must be, it's not a good thing just by virtue of the fact that it's a woman in leadership. You say, oh, can you say that? Well, I'm just saying what the Bible says. And the Bible tells us that when women are in leadership, it's a curse to a nation, okay? Prove it, you say. Well, okay, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. Remember, Isaiah is preaching to backslidden Israel, God's people. When they have forsaken the way of the Lord, they've, they've gone after you know, uh, idolatry and abomination. They're committing all kinds of sin. They're, 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 they're backslidden. They're far away from God. And he sends Isaiah, his prophet, to rebuke them and to correct them. And Isaiah, you know, you read the book, he starts pointing out a lot of things that are wrong with the children of Israel, doesn't he? Look at verse 12. What's one of the things that he points out in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12? As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. He's not saying that like it's a good thing. Because he goes on and says, O my people, they which lead thee. Now, who are they that lead them? He just got done saying, it's the women. He's saying, the women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. The Bible says that when women are in leadership, it's a curse. It's not a blessing. Okay, and that might not be popular, but that's what the Bible says, and that's what I'm going to preach. It's God has ordained that men should lead. Okay, in uh, the country, and it's you know more specifically. Now, do I expect this sermon to just you know rearrange Congress, to just change everyone's mind? You know, they're gonna they're gonna get Kamala Harris out of the White House now and, and put a man in place. No, of course not. I'm not stupid. Well, you know, one area that we can work on, the areas we can affect, are the areas of our church and our home. Okay, now in the church, this is the way it's going to be in this church. Now, there might be other churches where, you know, they'll let the ladies stand up and preach entire sermons, and, and it can be, you know, Joel and Victoria Osteen are, are a pastoral team, but that's not the way it is here, because that's what, not what the Bible teaches. You know, that's what we struggle to do here. That's what we strive to do here, I should say, is to preach the whole counsel word of God and be faithful to what the Bible actually teaches. And the Bible teaches that in the church, it's the man that is to do the leading. It is the man that is to be the preacher and the leader. You're still in 1 Timothy 2. I had you keep a finger there if you want to go back. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. He said, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. You say, well, yeah, I don't have any. Yeah, why, why can't we have women preachers? Well, if they can preach silently... I mean, as long as they can get up and preach a sermon without saying a word. I mean, isn't that what 1 Timothy chapter 2 says? It says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor the super authority of the man, but to be in silence, that they are to learn in silence with all subjection. Maybe it's so sign language. Is that what we're talking about here? No, what he's saying is that the women are there to learn, that when it comes to, now, you know, and then we get the people that say crazy things like, oh, so you're saying that whenever, as soon as a woman walks through the door of a church, she has to be quiet. That's not what we're saying. He's saying he's to, she is to, to, to learn She's not to teach, right? So when the, you know, when the church service begins, it's time for the word of God to, uh, to instruction to take place. You know, women are to remain silent. And they're not to be, surefire are not supposed to be getting up and actually teaching the congregation. And you can like it or lump it. You, you can say, you can like that or not. That's what the Bible teaches, okay? Men are to be doing the teaching in the church. Men are to be doing the leading in the church. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I mean, we already read from Genesis 3. We already saw in Isaiah chapter 3 that when women are in leadership, it's a curse. It's not a blessing. And it's not because women are bad or evil or wicked or God despises women. It's just that's not their role. That's not the role that God has given to women. Okay? It's not that they're less value. It's just that they're different. Okay? <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. This, I mean, this is pretty clear, isn't it? Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted on them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience as, all, as also saith the law. I mean, how, plain, how, more, how much more plainly does Paul have to say it, that women are to be silent in the church? And, you know, and this is kind of just a little side note here, because whenever, again, whenever you bring this topic up, you kind of have to clarify things. I don't like to just throw things out there and not back them up with Scripture. I can't just say, oh, men are supposed to be the leadership and then just move on in the sermon. Because, you know, a lot of people think, well, what about the women? What are you saying? Well, let's just look at the scripture, what the scripture says. And what it says is that women are to be silent, that they are not permitted to speak. 
They are commanded to be under obedience, as also say at the law. So, you know, women are barred from speaking or teaching during the church service, okay? And here's the thing, you know, let me get real specific about this, okay? I'll go ahead and be the bad guy. They should not offer their opinions or approval on what is being taught. You know, I as a preacher, I'm not, you know, I, I, I hope that all the ladies receive what I say, and they, of course, can have their own opinions, but I'm not real interested in being critiqued by a woman or having her vo- you know, vocalize her approval of what I'm saying, especially during the church service, which means this, you know, no amens from the ladies. Amen? Is, is, are, are there any men in the, in, the, in the service today? I mean, I heard one. Maybe we should start letting them say amen. We may get a few. The Bible says that women are not permitted to speak in the church, which means that, you know, amen, that's right. It should not happen. Okay, and, and I'm just throwing that out there. You know, I'm going to go ahead and kick that dog while we're walking by it. But, you know, what I'm getting at this morning is the fact that wise men are wanting today. I'm making the point that, you know, you know because we're saying, hey, women can't lead, women aren't supposed to lead in the, in the church, in the home, in the country, you know, that means somebody else has to do it. It means the men have to step up, they have to man up and be men and do the leading that needs to be done in this country, in this church, in our churches, and in our homes. That's the other area that we need to look at tonight, or this morning. If you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, look at verse 35. He said in verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches. In verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. You know, I, I went to a church where the pastor let this slide. And, and, it was, and it was like that, where the only person saying amen was the same woman. And, it was, it, and I knew this verse, and I knew what the Bible taught, and it just it grated my nerves. Now, I never went up to her and told her, you need to shut up. And I never said anything like that. That was the pastor's job. And if he's going to let slide, well, that's on him. But, it, it, you know, the only thing you ever heard was, amen, amen, you know. We need some hearty amens from the men. Who are, who are behind the preaching. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. The saying amen if you're a man and you approve of what's being preached. Say amen, that's right. Let it rip. But we need, uh, but also not only in the church, but we need it in the home. Men are to be the leaders in the home. You know, and, 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 and I don't mean 50, you know, the wife's in charge 49% and the husband's in charge 51%. No, I'm saying the husband is in charge 100%. That he, his word is law. What he says goes. His lot... And I'm not saying he can't consult his wife, get her opinion, take it into account, use, because women have, they have wisdom, they have counsel, they have guidance, they understand things. I'm not downplaying their role. But when it comes time to make a decision, a hard decision, whatever dad says goes. Whatever the husband says, that's, that's it. And, and the ladies need to submit to that. They are to submit to their husbands. Okay? That's why it says that if they were to learn anything, you know, if they have a question about what's being preached or taught, you know, now's not the time to raise your hand or, you know, give me a dirty look or go, or you hit your husband and go, that's not what, what kind of churches we walk into, right? But if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. And notice there, I want to put the emphasis on ask their husbands at home. You know, it's not tell their husbands at home. They shouldn't get home and be like, well, I'm going to tell you what I think about that preacher. I'll tell you what I think about what he preached this morning. No, it's you should ask your husband. What, what's that implying? That women should entreat their husbands, that women should ask their husbands, that they should be submissive to their husbands. And that's a whole other sermon. I don't want to spend all my time on that. But women, you know, who care about obeying the Bible. Look, I'm not asking, you know, the ladies to, you know, to, to, to please the world, you know, to, do, uh, to, to seek man's wisdom this morning. That's not why we're here. We're in God's house. We're in a Baptist church with the Bible, okay? So I'm assuming everybody here cares about what the Bible says, what it actually says. And if there's ladies in here who actually care about obeying the, the Lord, who care about obeying the Bible, God's word, they need husbands to lead and teach them. That's the thrust of the sermon. It's not, I know I'm kind of picking on the ladies on Father's Day, right? But the men got it coming, okay? But like I said, you got to clarify these things. I don't like to just wing things out there. I like to prove everything from Scripture, all right? Hopefully I've done a sufficient job of that this morning of the fact that, of proving the fact that men are to be the leaders in our countries, in our homes, in our churches. But what, what that means is this, is that if there, are, if there are godly ladies, and there are, that love the Lord and want to do what the Bible says and submit to their husbands and obey their husbands and follow their husbands and be led by their husbands, rather than having to take all that responsibility on themselves in addition to everything else that's laid upon them, they need husbands who are going to lead and teach. You can't just leave this void. 
because it's not a void. When leadership is absent, it's not void, it's a vacuum, there's a difference. Because a vacuum, you know, always sucks something up and to fill that space that's lacking, right? If you, I mean, because something, like, a, is a paper bag empty? Does it have anything in it? No. But is it a vacuum that's going to actually suck something into it? No. Now, if you got a bag like that at home, I'd like to see it. But a vacuum, you know, is an empty space, but it sucks everything it can. Whatever comes along, just, shoom, just pulls it right in, and that's what's in there. So here's the thing about leadership. When leadership is la lacking, it's not that paper bag. It's not just a void that it's just going to stay empty. There has to be leadership. Somebody is going to lead. So when that, you know, it's a vacuum. So when uh, men fail to lead, women will step up and do the job. Because they have to, because they have no other choice. Because the man isn't doing what? His job, his fulfilling his God-ordained purpose. You can see how I'm, I'm starting to get on the men now? Okay, you ladies can take it easy. It's a vacuum, which means this, that, that ladies that want to follow and obey the Lord, they need men to step up and do their job and to lead and to teach. And that's our responsibility as men. You know, God didn't give us to that to just make us feel extra important or, you know, be some kind of a, you know, dictator. God gave us that job because it's a responsibility. It's a job that he's laid upon us. And let me just say this, that requires wisdom. That's the thrust of this sermon. We need not just men to lead, we need men to lead with wisdom. And I'm telling you, this, in this country, in our homes, in our churches, wise men are wanting, they're lacking, they're missing, they're not there. There might be some figurehead called dad or husband, but he's not leading with wisdom. He's not leading with wisdom. He's just kind of there. And it's just something that's been an attack. You know, this is that role of, of man, husband, father, provider. That is something that's just been attacked in our country, in our culture. And I'll get to that in a minute. So it, because women need men to lead, you know, leadership requires wisdom. Look, if I'm going to lead, I want to do it well. I want to know what I'm doing. I want to have some wisdom about leadership. You know, if I'm in a leadership position, it would probably behoove me to go ahead and read some books on leadership. It would probably behoove me to go to the Bible and see what it says about leading people. Because it talks a lot about it, okay? Wisdom is what's needed to lead today. That's what's lacking. Wise men, not just men, okay? Wise men are sought. Why is that? We see examples of this, okay? Wise men are sought to fulfill the positions of leadership. When God needed to fill the positions of leadership through in different examples in Scripture, he didn't just say, oh, that guy will do why? Oh, because he's a man. No, it took more than that. When God was, had a job for somebody to do, had a, a job for a man to do, he sought not just any man, he sought wise men, okay? Go over to 2 Chronicles chapter 1, or excuse me, Deuteronomy 1. Go to Deuteronomy 1. We'll go to 2 Chronicles in a minute. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. You know, uh, one area of leadership, as I already talked about, that is given to men is that of the preacher, that of uh, you know, the bishop, the elder, the pastor, the deacon, these are God-ordained leadership within the church, and God has specifically said that those are to be given to men only, okay? That's why they're to be the husband of one wife. That's why I love when I run into these, you know, these ladies at the door that say, oh, I'm a pastor, I'm a deacon. I always want to ask them, I haven't worked up, you know, the courage, because I try to be uh, polite as I can out there, to just say, well, oh, really? Are you ruling your wife well? You got your wife in submission? Because that's what the Bible says, that they are to be the husbands of one wife. That they have to have their, their, their wives in subjection, okay? Anyway, I'm going off. I'm picking on ladies again. But these positions are to be filled by men and not just any man. There's qualifications. I'm not going to go on and about all those. But part of those qualifications is that they should have wisdom. You know, shouldn't you expect that the preacher should have some wisdom? Amen. Shouldn't you expect that when you come to church, the guy is going to get up and preach the word of God, actually knows what he's talking about? And unfortunately, there's a lot of places where that, that, that doesn't exist because they don't read the Word of God. They don't study the Word of God. They themselves haven't been under sound preaching and they're just getting up and just want to just scratch everyone's back and tickle everyone's ears and just tell them what they want to hear and send them on their way. And nobody grows. Nobody's led. Okay? And this is a qualification in Scripture that the men that fulfill leadership should do it with wisdom. It says in 1 Timothy 3 that the men, uh, the bishop, the ossif of, of a bishop, uh, must be one uh, who is apt to teach, not a novice. Not a novice meaning like a new guy, a guy who just got saved, a guy who just got into church, doesn't, hasn't ever read the Bible, doesn't know doctrine. All of a sudden, we're just going to make that guy the pastor. The Bible says not a novice, lest he fall into condemnation and the snare of the devil. Okay? He's to be apt to teach. That's why it says in Titus, I'll read to you from Titus chapter 1, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. 
So those that are in leadership, the bishops, the elders, the deacons, they need to be able to exhort, to teach with sound doctrine. And they need to be able to convince others through what? Through wisdom. Wisdom is needed. A great example of this in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 5. Of course, Deuteronomy is kind of Moses' farewell letter when he's about to take the children or let the children go over into the promised land. He says in verse 5, On this side, Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law, which is the entire book of Deuteronomy, saying, The Lord our God shall make uh, spake unto us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough in this mount. Turn you and take your journey. Jump over to verse 9. I'll move along as quick as I can. And I spake unto you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. The Lord God hath made you, uh, hath multiplied you, and behold, you are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. So he's saying, look, when God sent us out, you know, I, I was ordained the leader, that's what Moses is saying, and I can't bear you alone. He's saying, you've gotten so big, you're as the sands of the sea, you're as the stars for multitude. There's so many of you. And look, here's, here's a principle you have to remember. We all want the church to grow, and it will grow, and I, I'm, 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 I want it to grow. We all do, and it's going to. I believe that by faith. But one thing I always remind myself is that more people means more problems because people are people. You know, nobody's perfect, you know, self-included. I'm sure that's not hard for you to believe. But as we, this church grows like any body, just like as families get bigger, as businesses get bigger, as churches get bigger, there's more problems. That's what Moses is saying here. He said, the Lord God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are the states of the, sands, the stars of heaven for multitude. What did he say in the verse 9? I am not able to bear you myself alone. Because while they're out there wandering in the wilderness, you know, people have problems. They're having issues, and they're all coming to Moses saying, you have to judge, Moses. You have to make a decision. Lead us. Tell us what to do. Verse 13. So what was Mo Moses' suggestion? If you remember, it was his father-in-law, Jethro, came to him and said, the, the thing that what thou doest is not good. You shall surely wear away and this people. And he told, gave him advice to ordain men, to, to pick out other men to help him with that judgment, with seeing every case and the, the smaller matters, let them make decisions, and then the harder matters go up the, the chain, okay? And he said in verse 13, Take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. So when Moses is out there, the children of Israel, with this great multitude and all these problems, and it's getting to be too much for him to, to be, handle on his own, and, he get, and Jethro tells him, hey, you need to find my men to help you with this. What kind of men did he find? Just any guy? Just any guy who could, you know, just, was just a, just a man? That was the qualification? No, he said, take you what? Wise men. Because there was decisions that needed to be made. Judgments had to be handed out. People had to be told what to do. Leadership was needed, and when that leadership was needed, and that vacuum was going to needed to be filled by something, Moses sought wise men and understanding and known among your tribes. He didn't just pick anybody. He wanted men. And that's what I'm getting at this morning is that we don't just need men to be leaders. We need wise men. It's wise men that are wanting today in this country. Moses wanted wise men to fulfill an important role. I mean, Moses was going to wear away. And so were all those people. You know, when leadership lacks, it's not just the leader that suffers. Everyone suffers when leadership isn't there. You know, when the, when the dad in the home isn't uh, the leader that he needs to be, the whole family suffers because that's, that's his or God-ordained role. And he needs to fulfill that role, but he needs to fulfill that role with wisdom. Good. And here's the thing, you know, if, if, hopefully everyone's agreeing with this so far, that you need to be a wise leader. You know, because here's the thing, if, if, if leadership is just going to, well, I'm just going to lead however I want, however I feel, or whatever I think, I'm just going to do whatever is in the best interest for me, you know, that's bad leadership. You know, just because you're in a position of leadership doesn't automatically mean you're a good leader. <clears throat> you know, good leadership should seek to be wise. Go over to 2 Chronicles chapter 1. I know it's kind of obscure in there, but, you know, we'll find it. 2 Chronicles chapter number 1. You know, good leadership, because it understands that somebody has to lead, that, 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 that there is a need for leadership, Okay, we've already gone over that and who that leadership falls upon. We've gone over that. You know, the men in this room should seek to be wise men. They should seek to fulfill their, their, their positions, not just, you know, by default, just because, well, I'm the man and I'm in charge. You know, there's plenty of wives that, you know, god godly ladies that want to submit to a man of God or to a, to a husband, rather. But that husband has no interest. In, yeah, he'll lead, but he's not going to do it with wisdom. He's not going to do it uh, for their benefit. You know, he's going to be self-serving. Look, these abound. 
There, there, you know, there's plenty of that. What we need today is wise men. It's wise men that are wanting, men that are going to fulfill that role, but do it with wisdom, okay? Good leadership seeks to be wise. That's the example of Solomon here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 7. And that night did God appear unto Solomon. Of course, this is when Solomon's taking over the kingdom. He's just finished dedicating the temple, right? He's the king now. And it says that God appeared unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto God, God, thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established. For thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Does that sound kind of familiar? That's what we just read about. That's what Moses' take was on it. He's looking at this, this, the people of God and saying, These, this is a numerable company. They're like the dust they're like the, of the earth. They're like the sands of the sea. They're like the stars of heaven. And, you know, he didn't ask, well, you know, let me, be self, let me be served by this people. Look what he said, what he prays for, because of the fact that he's in this position of leadership. He says in verse 10, give me now wisdom and knowledge. Give me wisdom and knowledge. So he goes to God and says, give me wisdom and knowledge. Why? That I may go in, excuse me, that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this thy people that is so great? So when Solomon came into that leader, or that position of leadership, you know, he, he, he wanted to do it well, and he wanted wisdom. God asked, said, hey, ask whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And he could have asked anything, and God, in all likelihood, would have given it to him. But Solomon was a good leader because he understood the fact that to be a good leader, you need what? You need wisdom. You need understanding. You need knowledge. You need to lead with wisdom. It's wisdom that's lacking today, not men. And God said to Solomon, because thou, this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor life of thine enemies. You look, that's what a lot of leadership wants today, isn't it? And you look at all these representatives and these senators, people that go into Congress, they're not there to lead and guide people. They're not there because they want to go in and go out before the people and lead them in knowledge and righteousness and, and teach them the ways of the Lord. They're there for what? Riches and honor. They go in, they go in, they don't have a lot of money, they come out millionaires. And yet their salary is like less than half a million dollars a year, but they come out millionaires. How is that? How does that happen? How do you get a job as a, in Congress where you, you make you know, six figures a year on the low end, like hundred dollars to $200,000 a year, and that you walk out at the end of your term a millionaire? You know, something's rotten in Denmark, okay? Some, you know, that, something's not adding up there. The math doesn't add up. It's because they're not there to lead and do a job. It used to be that, you know, they, uh, being in a public office was a sacrifice. It was something that you were asked to do, but now it's like a career move. Now that's where you go to make it rich. You know, that's why it's legal for them to do all the insider trading that they want. Did you know that? And again, I, as, much, as, few, as little politics as I watch, I seem to get off on it quite a bit, but I'm just making the point here. That's what was in Solomon's heart. Give me riches. Give me, you know, give me honor. Give me strength. Make me great. You know, lift me up. You know, make me a millionaire. No, he wanted wisdom and knowledge, what to lead, to do the job that God has given to him. And God said to him, because thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, yet thou hast asked long life, uh, neither hast yet hast thou asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people, whom over I have made thee king. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches in, in, in honor, and such as none of the kings have had, uh, have uh, have had that have been before thee. So he says, you know what? I'm going to give you the wisdom. I'm going to give you the knowledge. I'm going to give you understanding. And I'll also give you these other things, right? But that's not what Solomon was in it for. He wanted to lead God's people because it was the, 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 the role that God had given him to do. And he wanted to do it with wisdom. You know, Solomon needed wisdom from God, didn't he? That's what he asked for. You know, he, he needed wisdom. Why is that? Why did he need wisdom? It's because a leader is supposed to be a source of wisdom himself. You know, when we're in leadership, you know, and, and again, I know this is the Father's Day sermon, but the ladies can apply this too, because ladies are leaders. You know, they, they can instruct other ladies in the church. They can, they're leading and, and teaching and guiding their children. You know, there's other opportunities for that. But when you are in a position of leadership, and of course, I'm speak, speaking more specifically to the men this morning, that when you are in a position of leadership, it is expected, or at least it should be, that you are going to be a source of wisdom. Therefore, you need wisdom. You have to have it, you know, and, and wisdom comes from God. That's why Solomon had to ask for it. He didn't say, well, give me riches, wealth, and honor because I've already got wisdom. I've got that figured out. 
I know what to do. You know, he's saying, I, I'm in this position. I need to know. I need to do things right. I want to do things the way you want things done, God. Please give me wisdom. You know, that's a prayer that every leader should pray. You know, if we're in a position, a, later, a position of leadership, we ought to be praying and asking God for wisdom and how to lead people and how to impart wisdom unto those that are seeking it. <clears throat> you know, I was, I was thinking about this illustration the other day, and I think I shared it with some men but after church, but, you know, leadership, you know, we're kind of like a funnel. When you're in a position of leadership, you should kind of think of yourself as a funnel, right? And what is a funnel? You know, it's, it's something through which, you know, you, like you think of the oil funnel, right, for putting oil in your car. It's got that big mouth, and then the little spout comes out, and you pour the oil in, and it goes down in the engine where it belongs, right? Well, we're kind of like that. We're kind of like that funnel. You know, we need wisdom to be poured into us from God so that it can come out and be, you know, put into the right place, distributed. That, you know, but here's the thing. If you don't, if you, you know, if you pour that oil into that funnel and wait long enough, it's going to go empty, isn't it? All the oil is going to come through, and then it's going to be empty. You have to keep, if you want to keep that oil going, you have to keep pouring it in and pouring it in. I mean, I worked at an oil change, and I got real good where I could take four quarts in two hands and just pour all four quarts. We had those big ones. Glug, 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 glug. And yeah. I'll show you some time. <laughs> what I'm saying is you got to keep the oil going in because it's going to pour out. And, you know, it's the same way with us when it comes to this idea of, of being a leader, of being a wise leader. If, you do not, if you're not getting tapped into the source of wisdom, you're not going to lead with wisdom. That's why Solomon prayed and asked for it. You know, and, we have to, and it's not like we're just going to pray one time, make me wise, make me a good leader, and then that's it. That's something we have to constantly be asking for, constantly seeking. We should be constantly growing in the knowledge of, the, of our, our God and Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. We should constantly be seeking after the Lord, reading our Bibles, praying, talking to others. We should constantly be trying to get filled with wisdom. We should constantly be trying to get God to fill us with wisdom, with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's expected of us as leaders to distribute wisdom. We ourselves are supposed to be a source of wisdom just by you know, the, the, the merit of the fact that we are leaders. <clears throat> wisdom is to be poured through leadership, not just out of them. You know, they're not the jug of oil. They're the funnel. You know, the oil is the wisdom. We just get poured. It just pours through us. That's the way it ought to be. And I'm preaching this because, you know, fathers are leaders. It's Father's Day, right? And that's, this is more specific application of the sermon. But fathers are leaders, okay? And God has ordained that men, husbands, fathers are to be the leaders in the home. And that's probably the most important leader that there is, is that of a father. I mean, fathers, they are the most important leaders. There are more, you say more important president? Yes. Yes. Because they are raising the next generation. You know, they, they have more impact on people's, on, 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 on people's lives you know, a, a much more deeper impact than the president's going to have. I mean, you know, Trump, Biden, you know, the things that they've done, you know, have affected my life, but not like the things that my father did, for better or worse. They, that, the one person that's made more impact on my life is my father. That's how important this position is. So we, as fathers, we that are our leaders, you know, we should seek to have wisdom. They should seek to be wise. And what is the source of all wisdom? Go to Proverbs 4. I'm sorry, I should have had you stay there. I know that's where we read this morning. You're wondering, why did you read Proverbs 4? We're going to spend some time here in Proverbs 4 at the end. <clears throat> and you know, we're going to turn to one other place. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians at the end. <clears throat> but Proverbs 4, you know, uh, shows us that fathers are a source of wisdom. And again, I'm preaching this because this is something that has been under attack in our culture. I mean, think of all the sitcoms that are out there that just make dads look like complete buffoons. The Homer Simpsons, the Al Bundys, you know, all these, every other sitcom that comes out, you know, the, the home improvement with Tim Allen, you know, dad's just this bumbling buffoon, and mom's always got to come in and fix everything that he messed up. That's not what God ordained. You think that's by accident? You know, that the Hollywood and they're trying to corrupt, they're trying to bring down the position of a dad, the role of a, of a father. Look, if I'm Satan and I'm trying to tear people apart, I'm trying to tear a country apart, I'm trying to tear families apart, you know what I'm going to go after is the dad. I'm going to try to make it, you know, I'm going to bind the strong men and then I'm going to spoil his goods. That's the illustration that Jesus used. No man, you can't spoil another man's good till you first bind the strong man, right? So if I'm Satan and I'm trying to attack the family, I'm going after dad. I'm going to try to make sure that dad isn't respected, that dad has uh, his power taken away from him, that the, 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 the wife doesn't respect him, that the children mock him, 
and I'm going to make him feel like his position really isn't that important after all. Look, it's an incredibly important position to be a father. And today, a lot of fathers, they're lacking the wisdom that they need because they're not going to the source of wisdom. I mean, we can go read a lot of books that the world has to offer, but they're, and I'm sure there's some wisdom that we can glean from it. And it seems like all these self-improvement books, whether they mean to or not, end up teaching biblical principles anyway. So why not just go directly to the source, the Bible itself, and get that wisdom? The source for wisdom for, for men, for anybody, but especially for fathers, is Scripture. Now, I will say this. Life, you know, we shouldn't just dismiss fathers if they don't have biblical understanding, okay? Because life is something that can uh, teach you wisdom, all right? And there is credit to that. You know, we don't, like, for example, my dad wasn't saved. My dad didn't raise me in church. My dad didn't take me to church. My dad doesn't care for the things of God. But you know what? Does that mean I should just dismiss him and not listen to anything he has to say? Of course not, because he has lived life. He's been alive longer than I have. There's a lot of things he could teach me about how to, how to be a man in this world, okay? So that is a source of wisdom, isn't it, for men, just by mere, merely living life and experiencing it, going through life and experiencing it. They, they glean wisdom that they can instruct, you know, their children. They can give to their sons and daughters. There is profit in that. You know, uh, the famous quote Jack Hiles said, you know, Doc, uh, Brother Hiles, Pastor Hiles, he said, you know, um, uh, what did he say? <laughs> I, he said something to the fact that I don't know everything, you know, therefore all men are my teachers. You know, everybody has something to, they could teach you. I guarantee you that every other person probably knows something you don't know and could probably teach you something that you don't know unless you know everything. You know, there's people that have experienced other things that I haven't experienced. They have wisdom from that that I don't have. You know, they've learned things and know things that I don't know. Why? Just because of the life that they lived. Just because life has has, uh, you know, gone differently for them. Now, I'll say that life itself, just living, is a source of wisdom, but it's not the ideal source of wisdom, and it shouldn't be the only source of wisdom. Because, you know, it, it could teach you, you know, a lot of times we're learning from life what not to do, right? But there is, you know, wisdom to be gleaned from those that have just lived life, even if it's not coming from a biblical position, even if it's coming from somebody who's not a Christian, Okay. We should respect and reverence our fathers just for the sake that they are our fathers and appreciate them for the wisdom that they have to impart, whether it's biblical or not, because they've lived life. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to know understanding. Now, of course, Solomon is the one writing this, and we know that Solomon was a godly man. We just saw where he prayed to get wisdom and knowledge and understanding from God, okay? But did he say, hear ye children the instruction of a father? You know, if he's godly, no, he said, you know, what he's showing us is that there is instruction. There is uh, to be, there is instruction that can be received from any father. Okay. And he said, I'm to no understanding for I give you good doctrine forsake you not my law. So life is a source of wisdom for fathers and they can still warn you of the pitfalls that are there in life. You know, and he says in verse 10, hear my son and receive my sayings and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, they shall not stumble. Take hold fast of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked. I mean, that's pretty good. Sound. I mean, what's he saying here? Don't become a gang member. <laughs> I mean, does it take, you need to know, do you need the Bible to tell you that? Or does any dad with any common sense be able to say, hey, don't go running around you know, rioting and looting and, and, and doing drugs. Enter not into the path of the wicked. That's just common sense. You know, we should reverence that, that, that wisdom that can come from any father who has just lived life, okay? Enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. You know, and unfortunately, even today, there's even fathers that lack this wisdom. Well, they, they, I've known people, well, they will encourage their children, hey, go in the way of evil men. You know, go be this, go be that. Go do these wicked things. You know, go be a drunk. Go be a fornicator. Go do all these wicked sins. You know, they try and encourage their sons to be like that. That's not, that's not good, okay? Enter not in the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn away from it and pass away. Now, Solomon is the one that's imparting this wisdom unto his son, right, in Proverbs chapter 4. Do you think, where did Solomon learn that? You think he learned that on his own? No, I believe he learned that from his dad. 
Because Solomon, you know, remember, he had, when he reigned, it was nothing but peace. He had no adversaries. There was no wars that were fought. David is the one that had to come to the, into the throne after being pursued by Saul, dealing with Absalom's rebellion, having all these wicked men around him, you know, and he had to fight and claw his way into the throne. You know, of course, God was with him. But he understood something about the path of wicked men, didn't he? And in fact, David himself did some wicked things, right? Where he, you know, he committed murder and adultery, which is pretty wicked. So I believe he was able to impart this wisdom unto Solomon. This is something that Solomon probably picked up secondhand, to not enter in the path of wicked, to not go in the way of evil men, to avoid it, to pass not by it. Hey, that's what my dad taught me. David knew about wicked men and passed that instruction on to Solomon. But Solomon had some wisdom to offer as well, didn't he? He goes on and he, go over to Proverbs chapter 5. What was, you know, Solomon wasn't perfect, was he? In the latter end of his life, it says that he loved many strange women. That between his wives and his concubines, he had 700 women. 700. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> okay. Two is a lot, by the way. Okay. Two is one too many, by the way. Uh, the Bible says that it's, you know, man and woman. That's it. Okay. That's a, we don't, you know, the Bible doesn't teach polygamy. It just says that it happened. Okay. But he knows he had some wisdom to impart. He learned what? What am I getting at? Is that he learned from life, from his experiences, and passed along his own experiences unto his son, just like David did to him. David said, hey, I knew what it was like to be in the path of the wicked. I've done wicked things. I've seen what wicked men do. Avoid it. Pass by it, Solomon. Don't do it. That's life's wisdom coming out, right? And a lot of times, life's wisdom lines up with God's wisdom. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to mine understanding. Verse 2, that thou mayest regard discretion, and thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh unto the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto, the, and, uh, thine honor unto other, and thy years unto the cruel. He's saying, don't be taken in with a strange woman. And he's not talking about, you know, the emo girl at, high, at school. You know, the, the girl who dyes her hair and, and looks like she fell into a tackle box. That's not what he means by strange. He means foreign, like a stranger, a foreigner. You know, a stranger, a strange woman would be any woman that's not your wife. She's foreign to you, okay? She's not, uh, you know, your wife's the domestic, you know, version. Everything else is a foreign version, okay? It's strange. It's a stranger. It's foreign. That's what he's saying. He's saying to, uh, you know, not to fall for the strange woman. Why? Because her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Room, verse 8, remove thy way far from her. Come not nigh unto the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. I love verse 10, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. Think child support. That's what I, every time I read that, that's what I think, child support. Strangers being filled with thy wealth. You know, the divorce comes and then it's, you know, then you have to start paying the alimony, the child support. And now it's like, it's, it's going to people you don't even hardly know. You know, it's going, somebody else is in that house now. And some, you know, some other dude comes along and now you're paying to, to help support the family that he's overseeing, the family that you started, okay? And look, I could talk about this because I, you know, I, I, I was on the receiving end of that. I've never been divorced, but, you know, my parents are not divorced. You know, I, I know I have some life wisdom in this area. I've worked around plenty of other, uh, of other men that, you know, they just complain about, you know, how they got a divorce and now their children have just become this financial burden to them. I got to pay this child support. Well, you know, you shouldn't just let your children turn into a dollar sign. Okay, but if, and if that happens, go ahead and pay it, by the way. Don't be one of these bums that skips out of the country and doesn't pay their child support. <clears throat> but that's, what, that's the possibility that happens there, isn't it? When you go for the strange woman, when you seek after her, when you don't avoid her way, when you do go in it, when you are taken in, when, you're, when, you're, when, you, when you are snared with her, you know, it, this is, these are the consequences of sin, aren't they? That strangers will be filled with thy wealth. Thy labor shall be in the house of a stranger. And thou shalt mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. You know, think there's the venereal disease. There's the STD. When you go sleep around, you get with a strange woman, now you're going to get some kind of disease. And what's going to happen? Your flesh and thy body are consumed. These are the things. And this is the, again, the point I'm making is this. 
This is wisdom that Solomon is giving to his son. And where is this wisdom coming from? Life. Now, I don't know that all these things happened to Solomon, but he knew something about strange women, didn't he? About the foreign woman. <clears throat> so, you know, that's, that is wisdom that can be found. You know, and, and both are sound wisdom, right? David told Solomon, hey, don't, don't go in the way of evil men. Solomon told his son, you know, don't fall for the strange woman. Don't be taken in by her. Both are sound wis wisdom, but they came from experience, didn't they? And this is what I want to get at, is that men need to be wise in their positions of leadership. But, you know, if, if the only source of leadership we have is life, you know, that's not, that might not be the best source. In fact, it isn't the best source. It could be, uh, because here's the thing, that comes from experience, doesn't it? And sometimes, a lot of times, men, they're, they're teaching, uh, their wisdom from experience is coming from, it's, it's a, hey, don't do what I did type of ex wisdom that's coming. You know, do as I say, not as I did, or as I do, right? That's what he's saying here. The problem that comes from that source of life is that it's often learned the hard way. It's learned the hard way. It's better to just trust the wise and, and let them teach us than trying to find out for ourselves. You know, I'd rather just take David's uh, advice and understand that, you know, evil men come to a bad end. I would rather just say, you know what, David learned that, hit the hard way. He understood that, you know, when you, when you enter into the path of the wicked and you go away in the way of evil men, things aren't going to end well. You're not going to go, well, is David right about that? Let me see if I can find out for myself. You know, I don't have to look at roadkill on the side of the road and wonder, I wonder if a Mack truck would do that to me. You see what I'm saying? I don't have to look at, you know, somebody else's mistakes and somebody else's outcome and say, well, I wonder if that's what would happen to me. It's pretty clear that if I stepped out in a Mack truck doing 80, you know, I'm going to be smeared all over the road like some deer or whatever. That's what life's wisdom often is, isn't it? Hey, don't do this. Things go really bad. Trust me, I know. Right? David saying, don't go in the way of evil men. I've been around them. It's not good. You know, you end up doing bad things. I've committed murder. Don't do it. Solomon saying, don't go, you know, with the strange woman. You know, you'll end up worshiping false idols. Trust me, I know, because I did it. That's not how that, you know, that is a source of wisdom, but it's not the best source. And of course, you know, life can give us good wisdom too. Son, here's how you pay bills. You know, here's warnings about debt. Here's, uh, you know, this, you know, uh, teach girls, you know, here's how to, you know, be a good wife and mother. There is good wisdom that can come from life, but a lot of times the wisdom that comes from life is a, is a don't do as I have done type of wisdom, if you understand what I'm saying. So wise men, they need, uh, or men need to be leaders, but they need to be wise. It's wise men that are wanting. So what is the greatest source of wisdom? Is it life? No, it is a source. You know what? The greatest source of wisdom is the Lord. It's God's word, okay? Go over to Proverbs chapter 1. The Lord is the greatest source of wisdom, the Bible. Because the Bible, you know, it's going to help us avoid these pitfalls. Like I was just saying, we could pick up Proverbs chapter 4, Proverbs chapter 5, and a litany of other scriptures and just trust God's word and say, oh, if I do this, this is what happens, for better or worse, that you reap what you sow. I don't have to go out and find out for myself. The Bible will help me avoid all these pitfalls. You know, and that's a great, you know, that's a great encouragement to those of us that maybe don't have godly fathers or don't have fathers at all, okay? Is that we can still, we have a heavenly father that has given us an instruction book on life right here. And if we'll read it and take heed to it, you know, we'll gain that wisdom ourselves and we can avoid these same pitfalls. Look at Proverbs chapter one, verse 20. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. You know, wisdom is being likened to a woman here, right? And we know that it's, it, it's uh, you know, wisdom comes from God, and God is using this analogy to help us understand something about him, that it's like wisdom that he has is like a woman crying in the streets, crying out. She crieth in the chief places of concourse. You know, God's wisdom isn't just hiding somewhere. Oh, I wish I knew how to live my life. I, knew how to, I wish I knew how to make right decisions. It's right here. It's in the church house. It's being taught. If you have godly parents, you have a source of wisdom. It's crying out in the concourse. You know, no one really has this excuse of, well, I just didn't know. You know, wisdom is crying without. In the opening of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning? And fools hate knowledge. 
say, I don't need the Bible. I don't need the wisdom it has to offer. You know, I got this. The Bible is just some old, you know, antiquated book. It doesn't really can't teach me anything. You know, the Bible says that fools hate knowledge, that they delight in scorning. He said, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. There is that analogy again, isn't it? A spirit, you know, wisdom being poured into us. And he's saying here that wisdom wants to pour itself into us. Wisdom is out there crying in the streets. It wants to make us wise. It wants us to give us knowledge and understanding. It's there. It's available. We have to want it. We have to want to, 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 we have to desire to not be a scorner. We have to desire to not love simplicity. We have to, uh, uh, you know, not hate knowledge. We have to want it, okay? He said, turn you my proof. Behold, I will pour my spirit out unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Go to verse 32. For the turning the way of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Look, there is a source of wisdom. Men, are, are they, they need to lead. It's their God-ordained position. They need to do it with wisdom. Life will impart some wisdom unto us, usually by learning things the hard way. But the wisdom that comes from God, that comes from the Scripture, it helps us avoid all those pitfalls. We don't have to make those same mistakes. You know, I can read about David's sins and say, well, I don't want to do that because there's bad consequences. I can read about Solomon's sins. I could read about, uh, you know, all the different sins that men have, have committed in the Scripture. And I can read about them and say, oh, that's what happens. And I can avoid all those pitfalls. I can learn how what not to do. I can learn what to do and how to do it all from this right here. This is the greatest source of wisdom. That, and here's, what, here's the thing I'm getting at. We as men, we need this. We need this wisdom. Life's wisdom is not enough. And it often comes from the place of having learned it the hard way, which is not preferable. Okay, He said, Whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Isn't that what you would want for your life? I mean, wouldn't you, would you prefer to dwell safely and be quiet from fear of evil? I know I would. Well, you know what? You need to hearken unto wisdom. You need to go to the source of wisdom, the Lord. You need to be like Psalm and pray for that, ask for that wisdom. Now, you know, it seems pretty simple, but here's the thing. A lot of people don't do that, do they? And you know why a lot of people buck at that? Why a lot of, you know, and we're talking specifically about fathers, about men, is because of pride. It's because of pride. No one's going to tell me what, I don't need, you know, what's that preacher know? He's not going to tell me. I don't need some, I don't need some book to tell, I can figure this out. That's pride. That's all that is. You know, going to God, you know, don't you think Solomon, that was a pretty humble prayer that he prayed? Give me wisdom, give me knowledge, give me understanding. Now, oh, I got this, God. Why don't you just send some riches my way? Why don't you just give me the life of my enemies? Why don't you just acknowledge how great I am? And he said, you know what? I need wisdom. I need knowledge. That's a humble prayer. Look at verse 24. He says, because I have called and ye have refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said at not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Look, that's what a lot of people do when they are told, hey, there's wisdom, here's knowledge, here's understanding. It's crying out in the street. It standeth in the concourse. It's in the gate. It's there, it's available, you need it. But, and when we say, well, no thanks, I got this. I don't, need, I don't need the Bible. I don't need any kind of wisdom instruction from anybody else. I'll figure it out on my own. You know, there's, there's consequences that come with that. Look at verse 26. Well, let's read 25 again. Because ye have sought it, not my counsel. You know, it just gives you this idea of a guy going, oh, here's wisdom. No, thank you. Let me just set that aside and just go figure this out on my own. Because ye have sought it, not my counsel, and would none of my reproof, that's a thing too, isn't it? It's the reproof that we don't like. That's the assault. That's what assaults our pride. That's why we don't want to pick this up and read it because it, we go, oh, well, I got that wrong. Oh, oof, I'm wrong about that. Oh, I'm in sin here. You know, that's what happens when you read the Bible. You find out that, you know, you're doing a lot of things wrong. And you need to get them right. You know, and it's the pride in man that says, well, I don't want anything to do that. They say, so they said it not all his counsel. They would none of his reproof. And what happens? He says in verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity. I mean, think about that. That's got, that's, you know, this is an analogy of what the Lord would say. I will laugh at your calamity. You know, you want to mock me? You want to, you want to disregard me? You know what? I'll mock you and disregard you. God just does the same thing right back. It's not like God is just some benign old man up in heaven just hoping everybody gets it. He's active, you know, and, and he takes, he's insulted when man disregards him. 
It says, all right, well, I'll laugh at your calamity. You want to scoff? You want to mock at the things of God? I'll laugh right back at you. I will mock when your fear cometh. You know, when the consequences of our sins catch up to us, you know, God's going to be right there mocking us. He's going to go ahead and let us have uh, what we got coming. Verse 27, when your, fear come, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when your distress and anguish cometh upon you, and, and why is it coming upon them? Because they said it not his counsel and with none of his reproof. They did it to themselves. He said, when that comes upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. You know, there comes a time where God just says, well, it's too late. I tried to help you with that. I tried to give you wisdom. I tried to give you knowledge. I tried to give you instruction. You mocked it. You set it aside. He said, no, thanks. And now you're suffering the consequences, and it's too late for me to do anything about it. <clears throat> He said in verse 29, for they hated knowledge, did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. <clears throat> you know, there's severe consequences that come with not taking heed to the wisdom that God has given us, to setting it at naught. Look at verse seven. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You say, well, I'm, you know, I'm a dad this morning. I'm a husband. I'm a father. You know, I'm in position of leadership in my life. I, I'm in a God-ordained position. I need wisdom. And not just the wisdom that I've learned through, you know, living life, going through the school of hard knocks. I need wisdom from God. You know, that, that, you know what that's going to take? Humility. It means we're probably going to have to swallow our pride and maybe even admit we've done some things wrong. <clears throat> and we're going to have to be humble. That's why it says in verse 7, and this phrase is throughout Scripture, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. You know, why is God going to give knowledge and wisdom and understanding to people that don't even fear him? He's not. You know, because he, he, to, to fear God, to fear somebody else, that's, that's humility, isn't it? That's a submissiveness, right? To be afraid of something. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. You know, the wisdom that God wants to give us and impart unto us is like a gold chain around our neck. It's, it's something that we can, you know, others will see and admire. You know, and, you know, and specifically here he says, my son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. You know, kids that have godly parents that are trying to teach them things from the word of God you know, they're, what they're trying to do is put a golden necklace around you. They're trying to, dec, you know, uh, decorate you with an ornament of grace on your head. They're trying to put chains about thy neck. And it doesn't mean like, you know, big heavy chains are going to weigh you down. I believe he's talking about like a gold chain. Like he's decorating an ornament of grace, chains about thy neck. Now that's what the instruction of, 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 of fathers and mothers it should be and is. And fortunately, a lot of times kids, they don't see it that way. They think, oh, chains about my neck. You're just trying to, you know, bind me and hold me down with all your rules and your restrictions. No, they're trying to put an ornament of grace upon your head so that other people will say, wow, this person is different. They know some things about life. They haven't made the mistakes we, other people have made. <clears throat> and the warning is to all children and to any who would despise wisdom that there's consequences for doing so and that God's going to let us eat the fruit of our own way if we, if we disregard it. <clears throat> and here's the thing, this requires humility, doesn't it? And it's proud men that reject this. It's men, and you say, why is wisdom wanting today? Why are wise men wanting? Because men are proud. Because they, 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 they've disregarded God. Is, you know, they, started, they, they believe that we all came from a rock billions of years ago. That we climbed out of some primordial ooze and, you know, nothing matters. We're stardust. You know, just, you know, if, if it feels good, do it. There is no God. That's where man, that's, that's the pride of man. And it's proud men that reject this. That's why real wisdom is lacking today because they've rejected the counsel of God. And they say, well, you know what? I'm not going to lead. I don't need to fulfill that role. But here's the thing about that. You're going to lead whether you want to or not by setting an example. You know, you lead whether you want to or not. So my, my admonition is, why don't you get wisdom to lead well? Because you're going to lead whether you want to or not, as either being a good example or a bad example. <clears throat> you know, and I've debated about whether even to bring this up. I don't like to talk about myself a lot from the pulpit, but I think this is appropriate. You know, my dad was somebody that I learned a lot from. And I don't mean to besmirch his character or, 
kick a man when he's down or dishonor him in any way. But, you know, I learned a lot. What I learned from my dad is the wrong thing. I looked at my dad and said, mm, don't do that. You know, uh, don't, don't, you know, don't divorce. Don't be a drunk. Don't take drugs and alcohol. Don't hang out in bars. You know, don't do all these other sins. That's unfortunate, you know. Because, and now I can look at, especially now I can look and say, well, you know, because there's consequences. You know, you get bladder cancer and have that cut out. You have stints put in your heart and you lose your teeth. You don't know your kids. You know, these, these, my dad taught me through a bad example. And I'm bringing that up to point out the fact that whether you want to be a leader or not, you're going to be one through either being a good example or being a bad example to your children. And we're preaching specifically to the men, right? So we need men to step up into what? To lead by being a good example. And how are you going to be that good example? By being wise. And where are you going to get that wisdom? From God. And I want to encourage the men, the fathers, the dads, the husbands in this room, and everybody else, to go to God for wisdom. To be, get the wisdom that you need that comes from the Lord only. But you know what? It's going to take humility on your part. It might have it be saying, well, I don't have it, and I need to get it. And you need to come to God and get that wisdom because you're going to lead whether you want to or not. And it's wise men that are lacking today. Let's go ahead and pray.